Thanks. So um, you heard a lot about um, you know PCP and other things like uh, the UGC interactive proofs and so on and. Uh, I'm guessing most of you probably recognize the long list of uh, results there, and there are of course many, many more from past years and uh, more recent ones. But uh, any good uh, mathematical theory is a little bit like the elephant from the old uh, Hindu parable where you know seven blind people come and each one of them approaches it from a different direction, and to each one of them it is something different. Right? One of them says it's like a snake because he's uh, feeling the trunk, another one says... You don't know the knots result? <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, you're right. <laughs> it is a good catch. That's a caught. Sorry. So um, uh, it's, right, any good mathematical uh, theory or concept is, is like this elephant that uh, everyone comes to it from a different direction and finds something else. And um, I mean, you already heard about a lot of these topics, interactive proofs, in approximability, of course. Um, polylogarithmic verification, zero knowledge, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's only expected from such a deep and important uh, topic such as the PCP theorem and the theories that go around it. I want to tell you about its connection to uh, things like blockchain, scalability, privacy, and transparency. And it's also extremely relevant, extremely relevant. So. I just want you to know that there are probably scores of developers around the world that are reading and studying things about zero-knowledge proofs, about uh, PCPs, um, and are trying to implement them. So um, because, again, the way I got introduced to the PCP theorem was from the point of view of approximability, and a lot of the talks uh, more yesterday we're about that, and I think also about tomorrow, uh, those tomorrow. So I just want to say maybe one big distinction between, you know, if you look at uh, approximability or you look at the scalability and privacy um, angles. So if you look at it from the point of view of inapproximability and you want to get results for that, you really want to do things like minimize the query complexity, minimize the alphabet, look at the precise decision predicate that you're using and make that as simple as possible. And at the same time, you want to maximize soundness. And regarding things like prover time and the length of the proof, I mean, it would be good if it's short, but that's not so important. Uh, you know, as long as it's polynomial time or even a little bit larger, that's fine. And you also want this to work for asymptotically large either constants or, you know, approaching one or zero um, and as t goes to infinity. Now, if you look at things like scalability and privacy, you are looking at the same things, but you have a different set of priorities. What you really want to do is minimize the prover time, which is the largest bottleneck. You also want to minimize the verifier time for a specific uh, soundness error, which is some absolute constant that you care about, something like 2 to the minus uh, 80 or 2 to the minus 128. And you also want to do this for very concrete, non-asymptotic sizes of computation. Right? So it's a different point of view. And of course, uh, we know very well that the first viewpoint leads to very interesting questions in theory. I hope to argue that also the second one leads to some interesting you know, theoretical questions. Some of them uh, that are still open and very interesting, and I want to share those with you. So uh, I'll have four, uh, four parts to the talk. I'll tell you a little bit about cryptocurrencies. Then I'll tell you a little bit about crypto proofs. Then we're going to get to the part with the acronyms that you can't have any talk without them. So it's like from Monty Python, the machine that goes ping. So we have that part. Uh, I hope to explain all of them. And then I'll list some concrete questions that uh, you know, I hope some of you will think about. So let's start with cryptocurrencies. So um, humans have this uh, amazing ability to reach consensus on certain things that should serve as money. Um, in my um, elementary school, this took the form of gum wrappers. Um, in prisons, it might be um, um, cigarettes. Uh, humans have uh, you know, attached value to things like gold or seashells. Um, and really, it's limited by nature. Or the assumption we have is that you know, it, this is a scarce resource, and that's why we can attach value to it. But it's all about the human mind in the end, right? And these days, we're all used to fiat money, fiat currency. Fiat means in Latin, it shall be. And 
to control the supply of such things, like uh, you know, U.S. dollar notes. Yeah. It means it shall be. Let it be. Uh, my Latin isn't um, you know that strong, but uh, that's what uh, Doctor Google and Professor Wikipedia say. So. <laughs> It's a well-known term, apparently, in economics. So that's what it means. And to control, to make this a finite resource, you can't trust nature. You have to have some trusted party. This could be a king or queen or a central bank. Um, and they are the ones entrusted with uh, making sure that there's not too much of it. And now uh, came uh, cryptocurrencies. And the main thing is, uh, so the, 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 the motto is, in crypto we trust. We don't want to trust in any central party. Um, and then the supply is limited by consensus, and there is no trusted party. And that's pretty amazing. So the main innovation, I think, of Bitcoin, and then all other cryptocurrencies that follow it, uh, you know, follow through with this thing, it's the first time some societal function, something basic that we all rely on to have our societies functioning, um, that we thought requires a trusted party, suddenly is replaced with some mix of, of you know, protocols and game theoretic incentives. And in the case of uh, Bitcoin, this societal function is fiat money. And uh, this immediately already raises the question that is currently being addressed by various other you know, developers and people within cryptocurrencies, what should come next? You know, law, corporations, government, religion. Um, but if you throw away the trusted party assumption, you have a new problem, which is that of computational integrity. And what is this problem? It's, it's rather a simple one, is how can the public trust the output of some computation? And the point is that if a party is executing a computation, if you entrust it with the computation, or if, you, if this party is computing something, it might be incentivized to misreport the output. So if, if you trust me for controlling the blockchain of Bitcoin transactions, I will have an incentive to, 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 to transfer all the Bitcoins to myself. Right? And if it's a small party, uh, you know, things like computing my tax report, maybe it's a small problem because you know, the government can come with a big stick. If it's a large party like the government or a monopoly, it's a larger problem. So Bitcoin's solution to this problem of computational integrity is that of transparency, which says everyone sees everything. So the blockchain, which records all transactions, is sort of you know, open there. Everyone can see it and all transactions in it using their browser. Um, and this goes in line with Bitcoin's philosophy, which says, among other things, you know, the following two important things. Everyone should be able to track what's going on. And in particular, I, you don't want to um, force me to buy some you know, special hardware or some very strong bandwidth in order to know what's going on in, in, in this blockchain. Um, I can just you know, c connect my, my laptop or my cell phone and see what's going on. And at the same time, you don't want to be reliant on any trusted party. You would like really, in crypto, we trust. So you want everything to be verified and correct from first principles without any trust assumptions or with a minimal amount of them. And currently, this solution, which is you know, how Bitcoin works and most other cryptocurrencies work, is already raising two problems. And these two problems are privacy. If everyone sees everything, it's very easy to decrypt and decode and, and know uh, the financial history of everyone. And the other one is that of scalability. So it's very interesting that Bitcoin that you know, came into the world in 2008 and uh, you know, based on the internet, so it should have like really fast uh, processing time, the capability of the network to process transactions is orders of magnitude slower than things like Visa's payment network, which was you know, started in the 70s. So Bitcoin and Ethereum and Zcash and all these other cryptocurrencies, they can process something like 10 transactions per second. That's all. Visa can reach something like 2,000. And you know, now, during the, uh, the, the, the shopping season, it goes up to 25,000. Alipay uh, uh, already deals with uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. And the only reason that this newest technology you know, that arrived in 2008 can't deal with uh, these larger volumes is because of these two principles, that everyone should be able to track the system, and no entity should be trusted. So how do you solve these things together? And of course, I guess you guessed the answer. The answer should be that you should use some forms of cryptographic proofs. 
the stuff that we've been hearing and dealing with, uh, you know, all these in the PCP fest and round. So we would like a proof of computational integrity. Integrity is defined to be, again, this is from Wikipedia or dictionary, you know, the, yeah, there's only one resource for all knowledge these days. <laughs> so integrity is uh, the quality of being honest. And uh, by extension, computational integrity should be the quality of a computation being executed honestly. And of course, we would like all computations to be executed honestly, and we would like to find a world or be in a world where that is the case. So actually, proofs of computational integrity are very old, probably thousands of years old, and here's an example of them. So the prover in this case would be um, the uh, grocer and the grocer produces a string of characters that she passes on to the verifier, which is the customer. And this is a proof that you know, then can be argued in a court of law or discussed uh, between the prover and verifier. And it attests to a computational integrity statement. The statement is, if you sum up you know, these items, you will get the number 21.81. Okay. So, now, this is just a special case of a very simple computation, but I'd like to, you to think of the most general case of computation, which is specified, and we have it here below, by a general computer program, let's say written in Python or C, um, along with a, a start point, which is a public input X, and an end point, which is a public output Y, that takes T steps to be computed, and uh, may receive some auxiliary input like passwords and uh, medical information and so on. So this is the most general kind of a computational integrity statement, and we would like to be able to live in a world where all such statements are you know, proved or assume, not even proved, but assumed to be correct and uh, trusted, okay? So these classical proofs of computational integrity are very good, um, but not that exciting from the point of view of uh, you know, computer science. Uh, you verify them by basically naively re-executing the computation. And it, it, the proof has some very good qualities. It's deterministic, right? There's no need for randomness. It's error-free. It has perfect completeness and perfect soundness. And it's a non-interactive proof. You just read it. It's like you know, a classical proof. Um, the modern kind of computational integrity proofs that, again, you're probably all familiar with are very different. They do use randomness. In fact, they require it. And they have a small probability of error. And they even require interaction. So we're sort of going away or losing a lot of the good things in these classical proofs. But of course, in return, we're getting, one would argue, much more. And this is where you know, it all started with uh, interactive proofs. The, um, amazing revelation of uh, uh, Goldwasser Mikhali Rakov. Um, and there, uh, there's a lot, a lot of different kinds of proof systems, and uh, you know, this is just a partial list. So by now, if we summarize some of the attributes as they relate to general proofs of computational integrity, so um, first of all, you have privacy. You can get away with uh, shielding uh, the, the inputs that you don't want revealed. That's zero knowledge. You can also have scalability, and I want to give a very formal meaning to this uh, you know, loose term. And in this talk, when I say something is scalable, I mean two things at the same time. I mean that for a computation that takes t cycles, generating a proof scales like t log t or t polylog t, quasi-linear t, and at the same time, verifier is exponentially faster than t or is polylogarithmic in t. And we would like these two things to hold. And in fact, you can get them with uh, uh, proofs. They also have this wonderful thing of universality. They work for any computation, see, even if it includes loops and lookups and it goes to the memory and branches and whatnot, you can get it. And uh, another thing is transparency, which again, the formal definition I'll give here is that all messages that, generated, that are generated by the verifier are public random coins, okay? In particular, there are no um, set up assumptions and no hidden secrets. Okay, and these things are extremely useful, these properties, and here are some examples for the uses of privacy. So um, Zcash, for instance, is a uh, cryptocurrency, a little bit like Bitcoin, um, that, that shields the payer, the payee, and the amount of payment using zero-knowledge proofs. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. 
Uh, you could also use um, zero knowledge proofs to prove in zero knowledge that you paid all your taxes uh, for the, the year 2018 without revealing anything about them. You could prove that your crypto exchange is in the black and can cover all liabilities to its customers. Scalability is very useful to address this problem of, of Bitcoin that we said that it processes only 10 transactions per second, whereas Visa processes you know, 10,000 or more. Um, so uh, for instance, if we assume that verifying all the blockchain of Bitcoin would take, let's say, one peta steps, um, two to the 50 steps. So you could have a prover generating a proof in 2,500 times two to the 50 steps, assuming that the running time looks like, in this case, t log square t. And then all other nodes can verify it exponentially faster in 2,500 steps. And the main thing is that you have no trust assumptions about the prover. Um, all you need is someone with a big enough machine to do that for you. But then everyone else can be sure that the state is correct. And if I have to summarize in hindsight, you know, I didn't know this in, in, when I started, but if I have to summarize my research, it's uh, a lot about um, getting PCP-based computational integrity proofs and getting them with concrete efficiency. So in 99, by 1995, uh, the world already knew to do zero knowledge proofs with scalable verifiers or with uh, you know, polylogarithmic verifiers, but those were considered galactic algorithms. The first T for which you would use this was extremely large, and the proving time was quite large. Um, and, and now, you know, 30 years later, uh, we already have things that are working in practice and things like this laptop. I'll show you some numbers later. And uh, the particular angle that I took was one that has to do with you know, scalable or quasi-linear PCPs and, and, and a more new or a newer version of them called interactive oracle proofs. And that's going to be part of the next thing. Of course, um, uh, you know, there's a huge list of uh, collaborators and people that, that uh, I've been working on for many years. I mean, some of them are here, uh, Nick Spooner um, and, and many of the folks in, uh, in uh, Starkware, which is the startup that now we're using to, uh, doing to commercialize. Uh, and here's another version of the story. Um, so in the outside world, when I go to cryptocurrency conferences, um, I'm viewed as a cryptographer, which of course I'm not, or as a you know, person that does blockchains, which was by chance. But I started off 2001 studying efficient PCPs, and for no good reason other than to understand how the PCP theorem works, uh, you know, to have my own understanding of it. Uh, this was during my postdoc years with uh, Salil Vadan and Madhu Sudan, and we ended up, uh, um, among other things, getting these theoretically efficient versions of the PCP theorem that also come with succinct verifiers. So it works with uh, Madhu Sudan, with Oded Goldreich, Pralad Harsha, um, Salil Vadan. Um, and then in 2008, uh, you know, actually it started with students who came to me and asked for a summer project, and they implemented some PCP on something like 64 bits for a single NP statement, um, just for the fun of it. And then two years later, I got some ERC funding, which was way more than a theoretician could use. So I thought that you know, it might be used to fund something like uh, you know, programming PCPs. Again, no good reason. Uh, my Eureka moment actually came in 2013. And it came unexpectedly. For several years, people were asking me about Bitcoin. And I brushed it off, as usual, saying, ah, you know, it's nothing not even bothering to read the paper or, you know, look at what it is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is recorded, okay? So anyways, I, I, all I'm saying is I, uh, you know, people ask me, what do you think about Bitcoin? I, I didn't know anything, but I, of course, said, you know, it's complete nonsense and uh, brushed it off. Then in 2013, I um, wanted to give, uh, you know, some talks um, about uh, implementing PCPs, and I was looking for examples. And it was darn hard to find an example in the sort of conventional world where you would want someone like you know, Google or a bank or someone to do a proof for you because uh, it just doesn't catch. You know, practically, it, it doesn't latch on very, uh, very well. And it still is the case. Because people who are used to the trusted party model, 
would, would start asking you, what are these proofs? And you know, who's going to prove who, what to whom? Is it the bank proving to you that it's uh, uh, holding your assets well? I mean, you know, you don't like it, go to some other bank. What's the problem? You, you don't, the, the bank needs to trust you for that. The bank doesn't need you for anything. The bank is anyways controlling everything. And then when you go to um, the cryptocurrency people, they ask a very different set of questions. They ask, where's the code? You know, can we use it? They will tell you, don't explain to us what this is useful for. We will tell you five things we need to do with it now. And this is still the case. People in the decentralized world, because you don't have a trusted party, you really want as many tools as you can get to prove to you things. OK, good. So this was, uh, in hindsight, I didn't know that back then, but it was, this was a career-changing moment. Um, later on, we published the Zero Cash paper along with uh, Alessandro Chiesa, uh, Christina Garman, Matt Green, uh, Ian Myers, Ran Tromer, and Madal Virza, which described how you can use a, a special kind of zero-knowledge proof systems that we were then implementing. It started off in the linear PCP model of Ishai, Kushilevitz, and Ostrovsky with a lot of beautiful additions of uh, elliptic curve cryptography and bilinear pairings of growth, culminating in this beautiful system uh, that is called uh, quadratic arithmetic programs by uh, Gennaro Gentry, Parno, and uh, Raikova. And uh, we had our own additions and improvements to that that we published later. So anyways, we took that code base. Uh, it also had a lot of uh, additions from PCP insights. And we published a white paper about how you can use uh, zero knowledge to improve um, privacy in Bitcoin. And this led to uh, uh, cryptocurrency, which is called Zcash, that is already live for two years or so. Um, I became a founding scientist of it with uh, my six co-authors. Um, but now uh, we have uh, a more classical PCP-based technology that we call ZK Stark. I'll tell you about it. Um, it's actually based on IOPs, which I'll tell you a little bit more. And um, so we have a new startup sitting in Netanya, close by. We're hiring. Um, a lot of our engineers are sitting here. And if you're interested, then please uh, approach us. So um, I just want to say uh, there are many, many flavors of proof systems. And like all the talks before me, I won't be covering or even reviewing most of them. And there are also a lot of implementations, especially in the past five years. And I won't say much about them either. But there is a website that you can go to and read all about them. So. Um, now we get to the part with the acronyms that I want to spell out. Okay, good. So uh, PCP you know already, right? That's one. Okay. Um, what is a Stark? An, argu an argument system, so here's a, an informal definition. An argument system, we'll call it a ZK Stark if it is zero knowledge, may or may not have it. Um, if it's scalable according to the definition that we gave before, that you have both quasi-linear proving time and polylogarithmic uh, verifying time. Transparent, all verifier messages, you know, pre-processing, post-processing, everywhere are just random coins. Um, and it's an argument of knowledge. Uh, the cryptographers know, know what this means. It means you can extract the proof from a prover that is uh, able to convince you. Um, and I just want to say that PC, uh, if you have quasi-linear uh, PCPs with efficient verifiers, uh, polylogarithmic verifiers, um, and you, then uh, you know, you're pretty much done with getting a start. So it's a new name for an old concept. Um, Starks, I just want to point out, you could make them interactive. Actually, in blockchains, where there's a sort of a, with every block comes new randomness, it might actually be very good to use that randomness also to make them interactive. You have a safer setup, and you also make them shorter and more efficient. And I also want to point out for those, you know, uh, in Hebrew, you say, uh, you can actually download some code and uh, you know, play with it. So there are two codes. First Stark implementation um, is called SciPOC. The second one is called LibStark. You can find them online and use them. So let's go back and see how you build uh, these systems. And here's a quote from the very famous uh, starting point of this theory, um, the paper of uh, uh, Babai Fortnow. Uh, Levin, wait, sorry. I think I should, I forgot the S here, Segedi. Um, and it says, in this setup, a single reliable PC, so this is from 91, can monitor the operation of a herd of supercomputers working with possibly extreme power, extremely powerful but unreliable software and untested hardware. And let's look a second at what is this setup. 
So this setup is the basic PCP setup, where a verifier expects Oracle access to a string of bits, which is the proof. And then the verifier runs in polylogarithmic time. So it runs in time that is polynomial in the input, because it must read its input. But then it's logarithmic in the running time of the non-deterministic computation that relates to that input. And we know that if x is in the language that we're discussing, then there exists a proof that's accepted with probability 1. And if it's not in the language, then no matter what proof is given, it's rejected with probability, let's say, at least half. Good. So this is the PCP setup. Now, if you would like to implement this inside some realization in the real world, the main problem you have to deal with is how, do you, how does the prover give Oracle access to the verifier? And this problem was solved uh, very nicely early on by Killian in 92, who said, uh, among other things, he said many things, but uh, one of the things there is that you could have the um, prover, instead of sending this, let's say, on a USB, actually computing a commitment, something like a Merkle tree root a commitment to it, and send this commitment. And then the verifier, when she makes her queries, each answer is appended with an authentication path or some, some proof that that query is consistent with the previous commitment. Okay? And this is the way uh, you, get a, uh, you get an argument uh, system for, you know, that you can realize in the real world from a PCP. Okay. So let's look what this does to scalability. Uh, if you take your general computation, that's the black line. Um, if you had naive uh, verification, let's think of this as the Bitcoin model today, uh, you would need the verifier to run the same time as anyone you know, looking at or processing these transactions. But with a PCP, if you have polylogarithmic verification, you could do it much better. Um, so the verifier would only run according to the green line, which is much less. So you could even define a scalability factor, which is the ratio between the, um, uh, you know, the black line and the green line, right? And the, the further out to the right that you go here, the larger the scalability factor, the larger the savings. So this seems to be uh, you know, great. And, and, and why hasn't this been used? Uh, you know, this was known already in 95 all of this, so why wasn't it deployed back then? There are many reasons, but one of them is that, first of all, you have to look at what, you know, for your given verifier, it is actually limited somewhat also by some computation and by time. So suppose it needs to finish its verification in one second. So maybe one second isn't quite enough to go all the way to the right, right? Maybe it's, it just puts you over here. So then your scalability factor is pretty small. But things are actually much worse than that, because the real limiting factor, the real bottleneck, is not the verifier time, which was pretty small even back then. The real limiting factor is, of course, the prover time, because even the prover, though she has a much bigger machine, is limited also by, some, you know, by something. So it's a much higher uh, bound. It's way up there, the, the blue line, but it's also some limiting factor. And the initial uh, version of the PCP theorem had a polynomial proving time, and this is the beginning of some polynomial. So really, um, you know, the factor that you get is just this tiny, tiny scalability factor, or you might get, you, you might be at a position where you have no scalability, depending on how fast this uh, blue line grows, right? So this was the issue. And um, the way, again, these early theoretical works that uh, we did, and the, also the famous uh, result of Dinu and the polylogarithmic version of it, of me, um, gave you something that's uh, a little bit more be well behaved. And uh, you have polylogarithmic uh, proving time, sorry, uh, quasi linear proving time and polylogarithmic verification time. And then it gives you some scalability, again, along this very, abstra very abstract scale. So we made some progress. Um, but but this, this isn't enough. And it's, you know, if you just take the PCP theorem, even with quasi-linear PCPs from, you know, from if you take the state of affairs around, let's say, 200, 2005 or 2008, you would still, it would still not be very practical um, you know, to be used today, let's say, on blockchains. So what? we did is go back to this setup and, and sort of revisited it. So this setup 
is the PCP setup, which is Oracle access to one string and, and uh, you, know, you make queries to it. It's very convenient, but it's, in terms of prover efficiency and verifier efficiency, you can do a little bit better. And I'd like to introduce uh, you know, the model that we're working in these days, which is, I think you should think of it as a very natural extension of the PCP model, but it has more rounds. And it's called the Interactive Oracle Proofs model. It goes also under the name of publicly checkable interactive proofs in the Rheingold Rothblum Rothblum paper, but I'll use the IOP version. And the setup is a little bit different. So the prover, first of all, writes, you know, gives Oracle access to the first Oracle, and then the verifier tosses coins and send them, sends them over. Random public randomness. Now the, verif the prover writes down or gives Oracle access to another Oracle and the verifier sends more randomness. This goes on for a number of rounds. That's the round complexity. And at the end of this, the verifier tosses more coins and makes queries just like uh, she would with the PCP model. So it's a very, it looks very similar to the PCP model. And just as in the PCP model, you could apply the Killian uh, framework and, and, and use uh, you know, Merkle trees and commitments and send them. And if you do that, you would get already your uh, ZK Stark, okay? Um, so really, most of what we're working on is building better, uh, you know, more efficient IOPs. And from there, you can get very quickly to a, um, to a start. And one nice theoretical thing about IOPs is that we currently can use them to prove all kinds of results that in the PCP or one round model, we don't know how to achieve and we don't even know if they hold. So for instance, you could get a two-round IOP with perfect zero knowledge and a non-adaptive verifier for NP. You can also get it for NEXT. Um, and we don't know of a similar result in the PCP model. We know of uh, you know, zero knowledge PCPs, but not with non-adaptive um, um, verifiers. You can get doubly efficient, constant round interactive proofs. This is the, the beautiful work of Reingold and uh, Rothblum squared. Um, you can get... Uh, an O of one round IOP with uh, proofs that are of linear length, where the length is measured in bits, and constant query complexity. This is a famous open problem in the PCP setting, right? Um, so you can get it uh, in the IOP setting. You can get also proximity pro protocols for important codes like Reed Solomon that have linear arithmetic complexity. The proving time costs you a linear number of operations in the block length and with logarithmic query complexity. This is something we don't know to get um, in the uh, PCP world or in the PCP of proximity world. And there are more results. The focus of this talk and what I want, and the, also the reason that we looked at these things is because you also get very, very efficient constructions. So, Using the IOP model, you can basically go from something that would look uh, you know, abstractly like this to something that looks far better because both the verifier running time goes down to a smaller line and the prover time follows more closely the black line and then you get a better scalability factor. And I just wanna you know, share with you some numbers that were measured from this uh, laptop. It's not a very strong one. It's, uh, you know, a standard laptop. I measured them last night. So this is the code base that uh, you know, the amazing Starkware engineers have been working on for now eight months. And it actually gives you numbers for a very meaningful um, computation, which is repeated invocation of a Peterson hash. Actually, this is a, a so a Peterson hash is a you know, um, provably secure hash that's uh, uh, you know, used in uh, a lot of settings and loved by theoreticians. It has a reduction, so if you can find collisions in it, you can solve the discrete log problem, and it's very useful. So here we have the uh, running time for um, computing repeated invocations of the Peterson hash, and it scales, of course, linearly. So if you want to um, verify repeated invocations, this is the time it will take you. Um, all of this is measured in milliseconds. Here we have the verifying time that you can see grows very, very slowly. So one invocation is less than 10 milliseconds, and by the time you go up to 8,000 invocations, it, it only doubles the verifying time. And the proving time, it scales, well, it, you know, it's, it scales quasi-linearly, but it looks like it scales almost linearly. Uh, so if you go to 8,000 invocations, it takes uh, 72 seconds, just above one minute to uh, prove, and if you're looking at 64 uh, invocations, 
it takes you uh, half a second to compute. And uh, um, the ratio between proving and uh, between naive, uh, uh, you know, proving or naive computation and proving time here is just a 35x uh, overhead. Uh, these numbers are going down. I gave this presentation, I think, two months ago. It was 100x uh, overhead, and you know, well, we expect this number to go down a little bit more. I have slides for the proof size. They roughly go here. They would be around, um, I'd say, 15 kilobytes or so. And up here, they'd be around, I'm guessing, um, less than 150 kilobytes. Um, so roughly between, let's say, 10 and 150. I have, I have later, if we have time, I'll show some slides on proof length for these numbers. Um, And uh, so another acronym I would like to uh, present is that of a stick, which is a scalable, transparent IOP of knowledge. So basically, it's an IOP that has the scalability uh, definitions. The proof of time is quasi-linear, and the verifying time is polylogarithmic. It's, of course, transparent. All verifier messages are public random coins. You could think of uh, uh, IOPs where you also have uh, uh, you know, designated verifier that use uh, uh, extra secrets or so on, and it's an IOP of knowledge. Um, and then you can even define a strictly scalable um, stick or a strict scalability where the proving time is not just a polylogarithmic, but it is a O of T log T. So the exponent in the polylog is one, and then you only care about uh, the constant in, in front of uh, this. And at the same time, you also have strictly verifiable running time or strictly logarithmic. So no more polylogs allowed. And uh, this is a higher bar to try and pass. And uh, in a paper that you know, we're now um, brushing up, we, and this is joint work with Alessandro Chiesa, Leo Goldberg, who's with me at Starkware, Tom Gour, uh, Michael Ryabtsev, Nicholas Spooner, um, uh, we'll, you know, we're working on the manuscript. We show that you actually get strict uh, ZK sticks um, as long as you measure the, uh, the complexity using arithmetic complexity, okay? So field operations, and your field size is at least as large as the um, uh, proving time. So I just want to say this result is also, um, you know, might be practically uh, relevant. Uh, the main challenge was to uh, deal with... Uh, random access to memory. Um, so this holds for any language in uh, non-deterministic time and also applies to random access machines. Um, and of course, this raises a very interesting question that I'll discuss a little bit later. Can one get a strict uh, stick or strictly scalable IOP with Boolean complexity? Um, so or a, fi or a constant size field. And this is a very challenging problem. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So here's one question that that would require probably some new theory. Uh, among other things, probably uh, FFTs for al algebraic geometry codes or things like that. So uh, this is a question I'd like to share with you. Um, now, just like you can go from a PCP to a PCP of proximity, right? So instead of, when you go from a PCP to a PCP of proximity, the question becomes not whether X belongs to a language, but rather, whether a certain function is close to being a code word. And you could do the exact same thing with an IOP and reach an IOP of proximity, where now your, your first oracle, you actually view it as a, um, as a function rather than, so this pi zero, you view it as a function f. And you would like to know whether this function f to which you have oracle access is in a certain code or is far from it. And then you can still have interaction, and uh, you, know, you can ask for more oracles, and then you test them later on. So it looks pretty much like the IOP model, um, but you care about the main difference is this soundness requirement. If f is in the code word, you would like there to be a proof that is, is accepted with probability 1. And otherwise, you would like, uh, you know, no matter what proofs are given here, you would like to reject it with probability that is at least proportional to the distance, the Hamming distance of f from the um, relevant code. And s is the well-known soundness function that you probably recognize from the PCP world, and you want to maximize it for any given distance uh, parameter. 
So um, here's another theoretical result. It also is extremely important in the you know, Starks that we actually implement, but it comes from a clean theoretical result in question. So the Reed-Solomon code is one of the most uh, basic ones in theoretical computer science. Um, it's the code whose code words are evaluations of low degree polynomials. So it's, the, you have, uh, it's parameterized by a field, by a subset, the set of points where you evaluate, and by a rate parameter. You can think of it as being, let's say, you know, one half. So in this case, it would be all functions that are evaluations of polynomials of degree less than half the domain size. Good. So here's a, a theorem um, that says that you have um, IOPPs, um, basically for a very large set of, uh, you know, a large subset of the Reed-Solomon code, um, where the proving time is linear in the block length, and it's as small as six times the block length. So for a code word that is n symbols long, the proving time is six times n arithmetic operations. And the verifier time is, at most, 21 times log n. And for this price, the rejection probability, the soundness function, is at least the distance. So if a, if a function is delta far from the code, you reject it with probability delta for small enough delta. So here it was for delta that is at least 1 fourth of the maximal distance of the code. But then we um, improved this, again, through you know, more theory, to something that looks a little bit like closer to the Johnson bound. So the Johnson bound would be 1 minus square root of rho, or 1 minus rho to the half. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Swasti Koparti and Shubang, Shubangi Sarah. And more recently, um, this we haven't posted yet, we pushed it up to 1 minus the third root of the rate. Um, so here's a little picture that, that explains what's going on. Basically, we know that the rejection probability of this protocol, which is called the FRI protocol, the Fast Read Solomon IOPP, um, at first we knew that it rejects above this red line. Um, then we pushed it to above this blue line. More recently, we pushed it up this uh, orange line. This is the Johnson bound, so a natural question is whether the Johnson bound is the right question. This is the unique uh, decoding bound. It's 1 minus the rate over 2. And we know of a trivial upper bound, which is uh, just uh, uh, 1 minus the rate. And this leads to another very interesting theoretical question, which is of extreme uh, practical importance to us uh, as we implement these things. Could it be that the soundness function of this protocol is uh, as large as the distance, even for a distance that is as large as one minus, uh, you know, as maximal distance, right? And it's an extremely important practical question that to resolve, you would need, uh, I think, theoretical uh, uh, tools. So it's a very interesting question. Okay. Now I want to just give a few concrete questions that, em that, that arise from, from, you know, looking. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the empirical conjecture. Testing is a little bit meaningless because what 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 is your you need things that you know are far from um, from from the Reed Solomon code. Linear programming. No, I mean what? Uh, how do you get something that is one minus all far from uh, from Reed Solomon? So I can give you a few examples, and all of them it's not too hard to see. Well, sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, I wouldn't say not too hard, but uh, as far as we can analyze, uh, this bound looks tight. So you can take a random function. That's maximum far. You can take a function that is a degree um, uh, d plus 1 polynomial, maximum far. You can take something that looks like uh, 1 over x, a rational function, uh, maximum far, as far as we can tell. Uh, but OK. So as far as we can tell, uh, Yes. It's a question about this particular protocol, but of course, uh, what? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, 
all things come with some cost to them. So for instance, uh, a trivial thing is you repeat this protocol many, many times. And this, you know, then sequential repetition and sequential reduction of error goes uh, as you expect it to, but this increases some other complexity cost. So um, I, I, maybe I'll later on say something about um, combinatorial, you know, maybe I'll say it now. So there are, of course, uh, beautiful combinatorial techniques that take uh, an arbitrary uh, soundness gap and, and amplify it to, you know, anything you want, right? Uh, you know, uh, Ran Raz's parallel repetition and Hastad's results and long codes and Navid Grassmannian's and um, gap amplification and everything. What happens is that usually proof length blows up usually polynomially. And this not only makes it hard for the prover to work, actually if you then compose it with Killian's method of uh, appending each answer with a uh, authentication path, you gain nothing. So you, made, you actually gain literally nothing. Think about sequential repetition. You have a proof of length n. Suppose you say, you know what, let me do, let's say, two i's, uh, let me look at all subsets of size two of this. So error at best uh, has squared, which is good, but the proof length has blown up quadratically. And this means that the length of your authentication paths has doubled. So you literally gained nothing from, from this technique. You would need some de-randomized version of combinatorial um, um, soundness amplification for it to be applicable to such systems. So yeah, this refers to a very particular protocol. What's nice about it is it's, it's a very simple protocol that is easy to analyze, and that's why it's also so efficient. It's basically just like the FFT, but sort of folded on itself. So instead of, uh, you know, the FFT takes a problem of size n and breaks it into two problems of size n over two. So this Fry protocol takes uh, a problem of size n breaks it into the same two parts of size n over 2, but then takes a random linear combination of them and repeats this. So it's a very simple to analyze protocol, and that's why it's a good starting point, and it's also efficient to implement. OK, so I want to list a few questions um, towards the end uh, that are relevant. This thing stopped working. OK. So I already told you about this first question, which is um, we'd like um, an IOP that is scalable, strictly scalable, in the Boolean setting. And the most natural approach that I can think of doing this is throwing out Reed-Solomon codes and replacing them with AG codes. So this is something that has been done in the past, and you get, uh, for instance, linear bit length IOPs and also linear bit length PCPs with polynomial query complexity. But now we want the prover to want it run in quasi-linear time. And for that, you would need an AG code that you can have encoding in quasi-linear time. And that's a, a well-known open problem. Um, maybe what simplifies matters is that the AG codes that we need don't necessarily need to be the kind that the, you know, the fancy kind that, that basically reach the um, Iwara constant and are asymptotically good. But still, we would need uh, quasi-linear encoding times for AG codes, which is a, a terrific question on, in its own right. Another question that I said, I just discussed it, better analysis for uh, the Fry protocol. What about reaching the Johnson bound? What about uh, going beyond it? All of these questions are extremely practical and relevant to the stuff that we are actually implementing. Um, another interesting one is, can one get a slice? So using the IOP model, you get all kinds of results that are hard to get in the PCP model. And one of these results is the sliding scale conjecture, which we don't know if it holds for the PCP. Um, if you could get a sliding scale conjecture analog for the IOP, so it might be easier because you're allowed to use randomness, right, than more rounds. Uh, you would want your error to look like one over the alphabet size or one over the field size and not like one over, uh, sorry, not like the rate, which is what we currently have. Um, and again, if we, uh, if we get such a thing, it will drastically, it could drastically reduce the practical running time of uh, verifiers and the communication complexity. So now going out of sort of classical theory results, uh, this is already spawning, I mean, this line of inquiry is already spawning, you know, interesting research questions in, our, in areas that are not quite, uh, you know, classical computational complexity, but are also very interesting. So 
Um, the crypto primitives that are needed in order to do things like Bitcoin transactions, the standard ones like SHA-2 and SHA-3, were invented in order to optimize a very s different set of constraints, things like, uh, I don't know, electricity and energy and the number of gates and silica. Now we're in a world where we would like to prove statements about uh, computing hashes. So we would like a crypto primitive that has the same functionality, encryption or a signature scheme or something like that, but that its stark complexity is much smaller. And Peterson, for instance, uh, you know, you go down from tens of thousands to single uh, thousands, and there are other more exotic uh, and newer kinds of constructions like MIMC and uh, Jarvis and Friday. The, this is actually a project that, uh, that uh, we, Starkware, together with the Ethereum Foundation, started um, you know, trying to uh, solicit suggestions for more efficient crypto primitives. And uh, an interesting question is how low can you get before you reach the things that are easily breakable using algebraic analysis techniques? things like the Grebner basis algorithms. So it's a more practical question, but a very interesting one. Um, another one that um, uh, I'd like to, to draw attention to is that of sort of applying security analysis techniques that are used when you analyze things like AES and SHA to um, um, the interactive proofs and PCP settings. You know, can you find better attacks on things like Fry, on IOPs, on PCPs? Um, anyways, when we deploy these things in the real world, they'll be already combined with things like uh, SHA-2 and SHA-3, and we will need to rely on security analysis. So we might as well start looking at uh, security analysis of things like PCPs and PCPs of proximity and attacks on them. Um, so it's another interesting area that's not no provable classical theory, but could be very interesting. Um, another one that, again, has started seeing work is that of replacing, throwing away the Merkle proofs with, more, uh, with better commitment schemes, one that would have smaller communication complexity or be more efficient. So I just learned of two relevant works, like in the past few months, uh, one by Ley and uh, Maltova. Ma OK. and. Sorry, I, I forgot the name of the other one, and the other one by Bonnet, Bunce, and Fish um, that suggest uh, new kinds uh, with applications exactly to sort of replace the Merkle trees with something more efficient. Um, another question that I like a lot that would only save a factor of two, but I think it's really nice. Uh, if you want lambda bits of security and you're working in the random oracle model, do you need the output length of your systems to have two lambda bits or only lambda bits? So like, you could allow collisions and still be safe. It's a very interesting question that uh, the jury is out on it. The last one is how do you formally verify things like a stick or a star constraint system? How do you know that the computation you care about that talks about Bitcoin transactions has been translated into something that is actually safe and secure? So it's a little bit like formal verification, but in a new setting that's very algebraic, low degree polynomials, requires a new set of tools. Um, okay, concluding remarks. So cryptocurrencies are decentralized fiat money. The main thing is that they throw away the trusted party model. And crypto proofs can solve scalability, privacy, integrity problems of cryptocurrencies. And this is something that not, not only people like me who are theoreticians of computer science are saying, but this is something that the cryptocurrency community is saying very, very loudly and is very deeply interested in applying these things soon to their own blockchains. Um, IOP and PCP-based crypto proofs are transparent. They have no trusted setup. They're scalable in the sense that I defined earlier. So they're scalable not just theoretically, but actually practically. And there's lots of good research questions for theoreticians that also have the side benefit of being extremely practical. Um, you know, big question is what other societal functions will be disrupted next? Corporations, law, government. This is a question that you know is right now. What happened to religion? <sighs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, religion. I actually want to say this that I am. Um, um, I think uh, you, you know your experience sort of uh, forms your view of var various things. So. After learning of things like you know, the ways that um, cryptocurrencies fork and then go back and you know, each one goes on their own thing. So I think at least my experience as, you know, as a modern Orthodox Jewish person, it, it looks very resemblant, right? If you don't like something, you fork it and then you have you know, 
right? And like in the joke, you have this one synagogue that you always go to, and then there's the other one that you never enter, and it's the same thing with cryptocurrencies. Uh, so maybe that's already solved. You know, religion solved that way long time ago. Uh, the second question is a, a very practical one. Do you know excellent programmers? Are you an excellent programmer with good mathematics uh, background? Please approach us. We're hiring. Uh, so uh, questions. Thank you. Does the Fry protocol work with AG code? So, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, huh. That's a really good question. I mean, the way Fry works and is analyzed already uses a lot of um, algebraic geometry. You're actually looking at a certain curve, a very simple one, and then basically taking sort of a, extending your view to a bivariate world and, and doing some randomness. So, I mean, I need to take it offline. It's a really good question. I would, my gut feeling would be probably yes for, for the right kind of AG code. Does the Fry protocol extend to AG code? So it's a little bit like a, it's a, it's a little bit like an FFT, the Fry protocol, but where uh, instead of, I mean, you break a problem into two sub problems and then you sort of take a random linear combination of them. So does that apply to AG code? So my gut feeling would be that in the end of, at the end of the day it should, but it's actually a really good question. That probably one needs a little bit of. Uh, Algebraic geometry beyond uh, you know what we used so far. Okay. I think uh, this is now sort of a you know, practical business consideration for Starkware, the, you know, full time there. Um, and we, I guess, ask this a lot. We all know, for instance, look at, look at the world of uh, you know, currency, right? So cryptocurrency is a, a drop in, in the sea compared to you know, real, I don't know real, but conventional exchanges and, and you know, banks and financial institutions. So it sort of begs you to think that, oh, you know, let's take whatever our technology is and, and go sell it or you know, implement it in the conventional world. Banks, right, exchanges. Um, our experience and belief is that it's much better to do things in what's called a permissionless, decentralized world, where everyone you talk to and works with you completely understands why you don't want any trust. The problem with trying to, let's say, go to the trusted world, to the Googles, the Facebooks, the banks, is that they start by saying, oh, there's this shiny new thing. We need it. You do a POC, they're, they're happy. But then they start thinking, wait, this isn't all that efficient. So, but wait a second. I mean, we're the bank. You should trust us, right? So can't we just sort of uh, take a little bit away from the computation and trust us a little bit more? And the truth is, yeah, I mean, in all these settings, you're already trusting the bank with so much stuff, or Google, that it doesn't make sense at first. So we think that this technology will um, go from the decentralized world someday into the uh, more established conventional world, but we still think that it's much, much better to start off just focusing on the decentralized 
Uh, yeah. Time will tell. Time will tell. We, our decision was, and we're very happy with it, to deploy only and do everything on uh, permissionless things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But uh, we'll see. Yeah. Wait, who did? No, I didn't understand the question. You're saying people took. Yes. I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. Thank you.